Um, so the next speaker is Dr. Mark Ware. He's probably the best known cannabis researcher in, in Canada. He's been studying the clinical use of cannabis for long enough now. Mention of the talk had initially elicited more than a little bit of stifled laughter. Since then, he has generated the single largest literature on the clinical use of cannabis, sufficiently so that, as Gabriella mentioned, he's rushing out of here to obtain an award for a lifetime achievement of our accomplishments in cannabis research. Uh, yeah, well, sure, that deserves a clap. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that's your talk. And to my understanding is you're going to give us a presentation entitled Clinical Use of Cannabis, Lessons Learned from Neuropathic Pain. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Marco. Thank you. Thank you very much to everybody for the invitation, Marco, Gabriella, and, uh, and for you for, for your attention. Uh, just give me a moment while I pull up my presentation. So great, a little bit of a change of gear because I came to this sub subject about 20 years ago when I had patients. I work in the chronic pain clinic at the Montreal General and uh, we had patients and, and for those of you who are just beginning to become aware of the whole medical cannabis and legal cannabis story, this has been going on a long time in Canada. Uh, in 1999, there were court challenges in Ontario that led to the creation of a Section 56 exemption process for patients to be able to access cannabis for medical purposes because it was felt that it was unconstitutional to have a law that would restrict access to a drug that was clearly benefiting even a single individual. And this initial court challenge triggered a series of subsequent uh, regulations and legal changes to Canada's drug policy regarding cannabis uh, that has led us to the point we are today. We're actually now informing uh, discussions around uh, non-medical cannabis use. But this has been going on a great deal of time and it began with patients coming forward saying that they used cannabis to treat their symptoms and pain was one of the most important ones. Epilepsy, HIV patients with severe nausea and side effects from their, key, from their uh, antiretroviral therapy, MS patients in the UK reporting that cannabis was helping their spasticity and so on. So this has always been a very, very heavily patient-driven exercise. It wasn't dumped on us by Health Canada who decided to legalize or reg, you know, put, put cannabis. This has been pushed by patients through the courts and Canada has been reacting and, and playing kind of catch up. Uh, and part of the challenge that we hear with lack of evidence and the lack of data is that it's been very complicated and I hope to show you in the next uh, few minutes how and why it's been so challenging to provide evidence to support or refute the claims that patients have been making so vociferously. Um, so my disclosures, I have two grants from, uh, from both, both linked with, uh, with uh, peer-reviewed funding. Oops, something wrong. Uh, and I have a, a small consultancies for a couple of companies that are trying to develop cannabis therapies. What I'd like to do is talk about dosing. Uh, and talk about how in therapeutic cannabis use we've struggled with this issue of how do you dose somebody in a meaningful therapeutic way and how do you measure that dose and how do we interpret this information uh, therapeutically and, and how can that inform uh, discussions around the potential therapeutic uses of cannabis and other indications. Um, so my, my, I think my first paper in this was when I arrived at the Montreal General, we began interviewing patients who used self-reported using cannabis for their pain management. Um, and we published a, a small case series of 15 patients, a very small series. It was just you know, a number of people that we knew were using cannabis. We said, why do you use it? What are you actually getting from this drug? How do you use it? When do you use it? How much do you use? And so we published this as a very exploratory analysis of what people actually did. And it was very intriguing to see that pain was only one of the things that they reported. That with improvements in sleep, uh, and this has been consistently found over and over again in surveys of patients and even as secondary outcomes in clinical trials. The, the response of patients who have chronic pain is multifactorial. It's improvement in sleep, it's sometimes an improvement in mood, although we had one patient who reported that it actually made their mood worse. But there was clearly this triad of pain, mood, and sleep, uh, which emerged from the patients, and we thought, well, this is, this is not just a simple analgesic. This is obviously doing something complicated. And these, of course, are patients with severe chronic pain who have multiple comorbidities. So we recognized this was interesting. The other thing that came out of the data was that patients kind of clustered into two main categories. There 
there were those who used cannabis through the course of the day, regular intervals, day in through the evening. And there was another somewhat a cluster who used it only in the evening uh, as a way to help them sleep at night. And, and what we found was that these patients typically used very small doses, very small quantities. You could measure the dose in puffs. They would say, I take two puffs from my joint and I put it out. And then I'm able to go back to doing what I do and I take a couple more puffs a few hours later. And this was an intriguing uh, finding. My, this thing's making a lot of noise, but I hope everything yields the signal if there's a problem. I won't touch anything. We, did, we went on to do further studies, actually formally surveying patients in HIV clinics, in epilepsy clinics, and this is group work, work from others in Canada, uh, looking at the prevalence of cannabis use. And when we actually started asking people in the mid-2000s if you were self-medicating with cannabis, we were quite surprised at the numbers. Um, you know, 15, 20% in some cases, as high as 40% in some of the HIV community. But they weren't reporting this to the physicians, they weren't talking about it, they were kind of just doing it on their own. And yet they identified identified with this as being something they were using therapeutically. Um, and the other thing that we found, there were some serious associations between younger adults, uh, mostly, like, like, most likely male, and associations with cigarette smoking. Um, so there were some interesting correlations with this. But we also found that the amounts they were using were quite low. I want to blow this slide in because it sort of talks to this issue about cannabis potency. Uh, and of course, one of the challenges, and I'm going to come back to this over and over again, is we talk about cannabis as if it was one thing. You know, ask somebody if they've used cannabis or not, uh, and that's a binary question. It, it be ends up being way more complicated. This is from about two years ago when we were following the licensed producers. And about two years ago, Canada began to authorize companies to grow cannabis, and we were tracking the strains that they were producing. And this graph shows you the distribution of THC levels on the x-axis and CBD levels on the y-axis, um, and the percentage of both in terms of percentage of the cannabinoids by dry weight. Uh, we stopped doing this because the numbers were so great, but it's been clear that there are three major types of herbal cannabis that these companies are growing. There's the high potency THC, and you can see here an average of about 17% THC, but you, they're pushing cannabis products up over 30%, and that's in the dried flower. So those are very potent, very concentrated cannabis um, uh, flowers. But you're also seeing high CBD, and this is actually a very similar to hemp cannabis, or the, the hemp that's used to make fiber and seeds, very high in CBD in the flowers. And so you saw a, an increase in the number, and this is actually much more, uh, much more prevalent now. But you also get this third chemotype of plants that can produce both THC and CBD together. The enzymes are co-expressed, and so you get these three major chemotypes. So when someone talks about using cannabis for medical purposes, we don't know which of these they're using, especially if they're buying it off the street, but we're beginning now to be able to drill down. As they're using products from a legal market, we're beginning to recognize what particular strains they're using. You've seen this figure before, and I'm going to rush through it, but it's because uh, Matt preempted me. But to remind you that the THC and CBD is not the only story. There are other cannabinoids that we don't fully understand. And then, of course, Matt also mentioned the terpenes, some of which have been isolated and shown to have pharmacological value. And it's important to, to recognize that when Sir Robin was talking about uh, skunk, the smell of cannabis, when the queen is smelling the bag and when anybody picks up cannabis and smells, it has nothing to do with the potency of cannabis. The THC level, THC doesn't smell. Uh, it's the skunk, the skunkiness and the piney and the blueberry and all the other colorful words that go with it is all about the terpenes. So you can have skunky smelling hemp. So if somebody's selling skunk on the street it, because it's high in, in smelling, it may be that it's actually not high THC. And I'm really pleased to hear that they're actually going to test what that is because I can see dealers selling skunk cannabis, which is actually very low THC. So I'm very cautious about this. And this language of calling cannabis by skunk, it just we, we need to move away from, from that language. <clears throat> to make matters even more complex, all of these compounds come off at a different temperature. And we've heard a little bit about, uh, about uh, vaporization. And vaporization, of course, you set the, the, the heating point of the cannabis to a temperature below its combustion point, which is about 225 degrees C. It'll start to burn. But if you heat the cannabis to a temperature below that, these oils come off the flower in the form of vapor. And you saw the rats enjoying some vapor. Um, but if you set the temperature of the vaporizer at different levels, these compounds will come off at differential rates. So even with the, exactly the same cannabis, this product in the vaporizer. If you set the temperature of the vaporizer at different levels, oops, 
you'll see that the potential profile of these cannabinoids, terpenes, flavonoids will be very different. So setting the temperature at 190 is not the same as setting the temperature at 170. And some of the vaporizers that are available now have digital scales where you can set that temperature. So you could change the pharmacological effect of the same cannabis product just by changing the temperature of the vaporizer. That makes it challenging to understand what's happening. In therapeutics, it's really important, and it was certainly clear when we were trying to get funding to do trials that we could show some preclinical rationale. There had to be some kind of rational basis. It wasn't, just patient, it wasn't enough to say patients are using cannabis for pain. We need to be able to do this in clinical trials. We had to demonstrate that there was preclinical value. And this is true for PTSD. It's true for anxiety. It's true for any condition where you might be thinking of using cannabinoids as a therapeutic product uh, to be able to look at the basic science. And it's clear from a neuropathic pain uh, model or uh, from multiple neuropathic pain models that cannabinoids in animal models uh, of neuropathy in every animal model of neuropathic pain cannabinoids in in that context look like really good analgesics they, they behave well so if this was just coming out of a basic science lab we'd be looking at these compounds as potentially very good analgesics but that hasn't led to synthetic products. So the fine inhibitors that Matt was talking about, the peripherally restricted CB2 agonists, the, uh, the, the, the different ligands that could potentially um, bind to CB2, I so far haven't emerged as options for us in the pharmaceutical uh, avenue for cannabinoid therapies for pain management. So we're kind of stuck with this crude, raw cannabis material that everybody knows about uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of studying it for therapeutic use. Fortunately, we know quite a lot about the pharmacology, and most people don't realize that THC has been discovered since the 1960s. It's been fairly well characterized pharmacologically. We know how it's absorbed through oral, through inhaled roots. We know how it's metabolized. We know how it's distributed. We know how it's excreted. It's quite a well-described molecule. We don't know as much about cannabidiol, CBD, and we certainly know less about about the metabolism and pharmacology of some of the other compounds, but the sort of the granddad of them all, THC, we know quite well its pharmacology. And just to kind of remind you how difficult it is, some of these are studies from Marilyn Hustis uh, in the US looking at the pharmacokinetics of somebody smoking a cannabis cigarette. And they use a procedure that standardizes the timing of the inhalation, the duration of breath hold, the exhale, the time between periods. So it's called the Fulton Puff Procedure. Nine inhalations over a period of about 10 minutes. And you can see the THC level in the plasma going up to around 150 nanograms per ml. You see the metabolite starting to increase slowly as the drug gets passed, in, uh, passed the, through the lung and into the first pass circulation. Uh, but what's interesting is that this is multiple doses. This isn't to say, they talk about these jo joint smoking studies as if this was a single dose. But in my view, nobody takes a, an Oxycontin and then takes another one a minute later and keeps popping. There's no other drug where we administer it in that kind of repetitive nature. We would use a single inhalation. And I'll come back to that in just a moment, because uh, my patients tell me that they don't use the whole thing. They tend to try to use smaller doses. The other thing that Marilyn has showed is this huge interpatient variability, so intersubject variability. The same dose, the same cannabis, the same procedure, leading to very different levels of THC in the plasma. So this is a really important takeaway. It's been very hard to standardize responses because the interpatient variability is so great. Vaporization has been mentioned. This is a device you saw the volcano earlier, but it shows very similar pharmacology to smoking. So it's actually a really, and, and Rob, um, Benedict mentioned this, it's actually a very reasonable option in terms of mim mimicking the cigarette, uh, the, the smoked root of cannabis. Uh, but just to remind you the difference between inhaled and oral, with oral root on the top uh, left of your screen, you see oral administration. This is about 15 milligrams of THC, very low levels of THC. The, the dotted line at the bottom of the curve here, which I think I can show you there, is the THC. These are the metabolites up here. But low levels of THC, much longer durations, four to six to eight hours. The inhaled route, of course, giving you a very, very high peak early on, and then the metabolites show up later on. And differences in subjective effects. So somebody inhaling cannabis has a much faster onset of the subjective high. It's similar to the intravenous route. And then the oral route, much lower, but much lower onset and much a longer, longer duration and qual qual qualitatively quite a different effect from an oral and inhale. These are from healthy volunteer studies. We began looking, because based on the patient data, based on the pharmacology, we started looking at clinical trials where we could administer single doses. And by single, I mean a single inhalation. Uh, we did one study with a, a device. We had to get a, a, a pipe 
approved as a medical device. We put 25 milligrams of herbal cannabis, uh, which was standardized on its THC levels, either no THC, which is the placebo, 2.5, 6, 9.5% THC. So we increased the THC level. And we found that the plasma levels were actually very low relative to recreational use, 40 to 50 nanograms per ml. The 9.4% single inhalation, you see here the peaking, at, you may not be able to see that, but one to five minutes. You see the peak level after a single inhalation reaches a peak at about two minutes. Uh, and then rapidly decays. So without any subsequent dosing, you're already getting quite a, a, a significant exposure to THC. Uh, we only found the, the uh, analgesic effect at this dose. There was no effect of the smaller doses. And then subsequently, an Israeli group came up with a small portable vaporizer that uses also a very small quantity, this time 15 milligrams, of a more potent THC of 20%. Uh, and they found a very, very similar pharmacology of the inhaled single-dose inhaled pharmacokinetics. Um, this isn't available yet. It's being put through clinical trials. It's now into, into sort of phase two, phase three. Uh, but if you superimpose, so this is, Marilyn, this is Marilyn's data from the, the nine puff cigarette in a healthy recreational volunteer. And if I superimpose on that the data that we got from our single puff neuropathic pain studies, that's on the same scale. So we're talking about much smaller doses. Uh, and in the study that we did and published in CMAJ, we had 1,400 exposures of THC at various levels through the course of the trial. There were only three episodes where patients reported feeling any kind of euphoria. One was on the placebo, one at the 2.5%, and one on the, six, uh, the 9%. So this didn't result in patients feeling psychoactively euphoric. Um, and I think there may be something really interesting to take away from therapeutics, is we need to get the doses right. We have prescription cannabinoids, and the reason I put this up here is to, to say two things. One is, if you look at the single unit doses of THC in, uh, in dronabinol, if you look at the single unit dose of nabilone, which is a very potent CB1 agonist, uh, and nabiximols, which is a, a, a mucosal spray, you see that the same kind of doses apply. 2.5 milligrams of THC in the smallest dose, 2.7 milligrams THC in nabiximols in a single dose. 0.25 of nabilone, which is about 10 times more potent, so it's about the same equivalence. So this 2.5 milligram THC single unit dose is something, and if you do the calculations from our studies, you actually end up that, uh, you know, 10% of 225 milligrams is 2.5 milligrams of THC. So you're getting similar kinds of exposure. And this troubles me when I see reports like this from the National Academy of Sciences when they report their big conclusions and they say there's conclusive or substantial evidence that cannabis or cannabinoids are effective for the treatment in chronic pain cannabis. That tells me nothing about what cannabinoid, what mode of administration, what type of patient. Um, and I find this sort of oversimplification of this whole idea very, very challenging. Fortunately, there are attempts to move in the right direction. Cannabidiol has now been taken by one company and put into clinical trials. Uh, I'm often asked, why isn't there more industry interest? It's very hard to patent THC. It's very hard to patent combinations of THC and CBD. It's hard to patent these. Potentially, these new drug delivery systems are patentable. But it's very hard for the industry to invest in this kind of clinical trial infrastructure without some degree of IP protection. I think in the case of cannabidiol for Dravet syndrome, where they showed a positive positive effect, uh, they were able to secure an orphan drug status. Um, but the important thing about cannabidiol is the doses here in the children that they were using was 20 milligrams per kilogram, which if you e extrapolate to a male, uh, an adult male or female, you're talking about two, uh, three, 400 milligrams of t CBD. And this is true from Brazilian studies, it's true from studies in Europe. Cannabidiol can be administered in much, much higher doses uh, orally, uh, much more safely as it doesn't have the psychoactive potential of THC. We can control for a lot of the adverse events just by recruiting uh, patients based on good quality screening and for all our clinical trials. In general practice, when we talk about cannabinoid use in clinical medicine, we contraindicated if you have a history of psychosis or a family history. We don't use cannabinoids in people with unstable heart disease. We avoid them in pregnancy, breastfeeding women. We're careful if people have a history of cannabis use disorder. If they're under 25, there's a severe mood disorder. There's a, a short list of reasons to be careful if you're authorizing cannabinoids for medical use, um, and that can you know, help to mitigate risk as well. 
Uh, but of course, the medical program as it is now is very, uh, is very simplistic. You authorize a patient to possess cannabis, and you have to specify on the medical document a dose in grams per day, which for most physicians is not considering doses. This, a gram of cannabis could contain 10% THC, 20% THC, 8% CBD, both together. It could contain terp. It really isn't a meaningful dosing unit. And I think we need to move into an area where we're talking about doses much more specifically. Um, if I have a few minutes, uh, Gabrielle, am I okay? No, I'm running out of time. Okay, so I'll, I'll just tell you that there are 250,000 patients in Canada now who are authorized to use cannabis under the ACMPR, which is the newest regulator. We know nothing about who, how much, when there's no systematic prospective pharmacovigilance program in place. We have one in Quebec. We're following about 2,000 patients, hoping to get 3,000, um, but there's no, nothing else that we're learning from. Um, the conclusions that I'd like to sort of summarize from my experiences doing therapeutic work, that idea of just cannabis, medical, it's a very complex construct, socially, medically, therapeutically, pharmacologically. Dose is critical, and yet we're really bad at measuring it. There are terpene, cannabinoid contents, we need to start to specify. We need to specify modes of administration. There's huge variability, both in the doses used, but also products. You know, there's different modes of, of administration from oils to, to inhaled, vaporized, and, <clears throat> and I think fundamentally my closing line is that we need to get standardization, both for clinical and epidemiological. Um, we need to get into a system where we can actually compare what cannabis use is uh, at a population level, individual level. There was a, a while where the epidemiology literature talked about joint years of exposure. If you smoke one joint every day for one year, that was one joint year. Uh, of course, joints can be like this, they can be like this. <laughs> joints can contain different levels of THC. So, you know, what does that tell us? Not much. Um, I'd like to propose that we move to a system much like we have with opioids, where we talk about milligrams of THC equivalents, and that can actually standardize across different levels of exposure. Um, I think there's a lot of work to be done in the coming years to standardize this, um, but uh, I'd like to stop there and thank you for your time. <laughs> no questions. All right, thank you very much. Best of luck.